Others have very ably already discussed what's happening in Xinjiang, so I won't use my time on that. Instead, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about terminology. I believe that if we are to treat what is happening in Xinjiang with the seriousness and alarm that it merits, we first need to accurately label what it is we are witnessing. So official Chinese sources refer to these as transformation through education centers or counter-extremism centers. And outside China, they're fre frequently called re-education camps. But from what we've heard today, we know these are somewhat euphemistic characterizations, and they do not clearly and precisely define what it is we are witnessing. Some observers have called these concentration camps based on a definition of this, the state for the reasons of state security, targeting in particular ethnic and religious minorities and confining them into um, sp certain spaces. Other peoples have wondered whether these camps, because they're interning uh, religious and ethnic minorities, could presage something much worse, like ethnic cleansing. And while I'm not an expert in international law, and I don't feel I have standing to offer the legal term of art, which most accurately defines what we're seeing, I think uh, the US government and the international community in general needs to think very hard about what's happening in these camps and what we should call them, and whether they are an early warning sign of something much worse to come. Turning to the Chinese leadership. Uh, despite a general lack of uh, insight into Chinese leadership politics, Xinjiang Party Secretary Chen Chuanguo's role in this is unusually clear. His tenure coincides not only with the large-scale use of these camps, but as you noted, uh, with the building of uh, thousands of convenience police stations, with a ma massive increase in security personnel hiring and overall security spending, and as we know now, a uh, massive increase in arrests as well. And this pattern of securitization, as was previously mentioned, echoes very clearly Chen Chuanguo's security policies in another ethnic minority region in China, Tibet, when he was party secretary there from 2011 to 2016. But though Chen has been directly responsible for overseeing these policies, neither Chen nor the policies themselves are sui generis. They clearly fit into a larger policy trend of criminalization of ethnic and religious identity. And that traces from central level guidance, at least from 2014, if not earlier, down through regular regional regulations and local implementation. So what is the impact beyond Xinjiang? Domestically, surveillance capabilities and restrictive measures could be employed, and, and indeed by some accounts they already are being employed, against other ethnic or religious minorities in China. Internationally, as we've discussed, Uyghurs and exiled are not only surveilled, but they can be coerced into reporting on fellow Uyghurs um, that to Chinese state security authorities. Other governments have assisted China in forcibly repatriating ethnic minorities back to Xinjiang. And finally, there's the issue of Chinese government pressure, even indirectly, um, often encouraging self-censorship among those of us who are here working and writing on China. So I'm going to make a few policy recommendations. It is a mistake to think that staying silent on human rights in China is a neutral act. Instead, every instance of silence just resets Beijing's expectations, and it raises the psychic cost of re-injecting human rights back into the conversation later. Beijing still does care about its international reputation, meaning that both public and diplomatic pressure can be effective tools in encouraging change. My full recommendations are in my written statement, but I'll just highlight a few of them here. First, to maintain a clear, consistent, and full-throated public defense of human rights and religious freedom in Xinjiang, in addition to direct diplomatic engagement to work with like-minded countries, particularly Muslim-majority countries, to coordinate an inter international response to the situation in Xinjiang, and offer support to PRC citizens who have fled Xinjiang, whether here or in the United States or elsewhere around the globe, to limit private companies' ability to provide training or equipment to Chinese state security agencies, and the chair's recent letter to Secretary Ross is very helpful in this regard, and finally, to sanction right, relevant Chinese officials under the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. Any sanctions pack package should include Xinjiang Party Secretary Chen Chuanguo. Sanctioning a sitting Politburo member who is one of, one of the top 25 leaders of the Chinese Communist Party in China would clearly and uh, convey the United States unequivocal condemnation of these camps. There's a list of ad additional leaders for your consideration in my written statement. Thank you for your time. I welcome your questions.